Pikuach nefesh, saving a life. Again, as I said last week, that's the term most of us are familiar with. We know about pikuach nefesh. It's part of the, uh, I think, the principles of Judaism that liberal Jews in particular are very proud of. Because we say, look, going all the way back to Talmudic times, the rabbis believed in flexibility. Even when it came to the most important subjects and observances of Judaism, Shabbat observance, you know, we saw the pregnant woman, right? Eating a, basically eating pig gravy, even when it comes to the most important, possibly even offensive sins in Judaism, there's space in the literature to allow for flexibility. We tried to explore the limits of that space in last week's class and introduced another theme or an, another term that everybody should be familiar with after last week's class, and that is safek nefashot. Safek nefashot means doubt of someone's life being at risk. That is a little bit different than pikuach nefesh. Pikuach nefesh is when a life will be saved. Safek nefashot is a life may be at risk. It's not exactly clear which situation gets which heading. And I think that that is uh, most firmly affirmed um, in the case that we read about the pregnant woman, because that whole case was explained with the term pikuach nefesh. We have to do everything possible to save her life, but it's not really a life or death situation, is it? It's a pregnant woman who's, who has a really bad craving. I mean, I get that that's not easy to have a craving, but it's very different than somebody who's trapped in a burning building. And if you don't save them, they will definitely die. So pikuach nefesh has some flexibility there. And safek nefashot certainly has flexibility. Last week, the cases of safek nefashot, I just want to remind you, the case that we reviewed was a person who was ill, ill, who requires treatment on Shabbat. One of the prohibitions on Shabbat that some of us are less familiar with is the prohibition against taking medicine on Shabbat. But when a life is at stake, uh, actually, I don't even want to say that because the, the, the Talmud doesn't say a life is at stake. It just says they're ill. If you are ill, you are permitted, if you remember, to give this person a bath, to give the person the medicine that he or she needs, all for the sake of safek nefashot. An illness could get even worse. Today, we're going to look at a few more examples from that same section of the Talmud. And I want you to pay attention to the cases that are being cited and whether you would consider them to be life or death situations. The other thing I'd like you to consider is what the case we're looking at. The Talmud's a beautiful book of jurisprudence, right? You have a legal concept and then it throws different cases at you, which show how such a concept might be effective or ineffective in one case and another. That's typically how the Talmud works. But it doesn't just throw in cases for no reason. The cases that it's introducing, uh, one should add some layer of, of uh, knowledge or nuance that the previous story did not add. So that's what I want us to pay attention to. Is it a life or death situation? And what is the added information that I'm getting from this case 
that I didn't know already from, let's say, the pregnant woman or the ill person. Okay? In this section of the Talmud, just because we're going to pick up in the middle, remember we are dealing with the violation of Shabbat. Okay? Remember, there are three sins that were introduced to us in the first source that we learned. Three sins where you are required to submit your life rather than violate them. They are negative commandments. Thou shalt not. Does anyone remember them? Just take a look. Here, why don't I just share my screen with you so we can see that I'm not making this up. Can everyone give me a thumbs up if they can see? Can you all see what's on my screen? Okay, great. Remember what it says, idol worship, forbidden sexual relations, and bloodshed. Gilui arayot, shfichut damim, and avodah zara. That's what that ayin, this, this, these two letters here, ayin zayin, sorry, you can see my, the mouse on my screen. That stands for avodah zara, idol worship. Except for these three things, Life comes first. Well, since Shabbat is not enumerated among the three, so we learn that we can violate Shabbat if a need arises. So here in front of you is the first case that we learned. Heating up water for an ill person on Shabbat, whether to give him to drink or to wash. We learned that last week. And remember, I got into at the end of the class that there's great leniency here in helping this person out. There's even, the Talmud says, a need to act that the highest scholars in the community should rush in to break Shabbat to save this person. And there's a dispute, remember, about why. Is it because they have to set an example to um, other people? Or is it because only the smartest people in the community know whether it's truly a case deserving of violating Shabbat or not. These are the two caveats that Morley introduced, and these um, are played out. These questions are played out in later halachic literature. Why is it that, it ha that the rabbi should act quickly rather than ask somebody else to do it? Okay, let's now uh, go to the next case. Um, Gloria, are you able to read for us the next case in the same section of Talmud? Okay, and, and I guarantee you, you'll be able to pick this up. Everybody will be able to pick this up quickly. It's not too complicated, this text. Go okay. ahead, Gloria. The sages Sage, taught in a baraita. A baraita. One engages in saving a life on Shabbat, and one who is vigilant to do so is praiseworthy. Okay, now vigilant is not the word I would translate as. Remember, I'm saying I'm using the translation of Safaria, which is a great uh, web resource online. The Hebrew is Zariz. Zariz. Zariz, I wouldn't translate that as vigilant. I would translate Zariz as eager. One who is eager to do so is praiseworthy. In other words, if somebody's life is at stake on Shabbat, it's not that you're vigilant. I don't, I don't really know what that means. You're vigilant to save his life. It's that you're eager to save his life. You don't pause and think, is it really worth breaking Shabbos to save this guy? He's not really a nice guy anyway. You, no, you rush and help save his life. Okay, Zariz, eager to, to do so. Okay, go ahead, Gloria. Everyone's with me here? Good. And one need not take permission from a court, but hurries to act on his own. Ah, so there's added emphasis, right, on this zariz, eagerness. Sometimes, now Morley, this, this um, doesn't it challenge the, um, doesn't it challenge the point we made at the end of last class, which is, may be the reason why the previous paragraph says the scholars should run to do it. One of the plausible reasons we put forward for why it should be the scholars is because the scholars know how to tell the difference between a case that really deserves breaking Shabbat 
and it can, you know, the person's just a little sick and and you know it's not that urgent that you know if you ask me this paragraph makes it clear that no we don't want rabbis deciding in the moment whether it's really a case that requires breaking Shabbat or not. I don't know if you all agree with me, but to me, it seems like we don't want rabbis having an argument while this is going on. There is somebody in front of us who is sick. You just help them. There is somebody whose life is in danger. You help them. And God forbid you go to some court to get an opinion. Right. So for me, this adds weight to the notion that the reason the scholars are um, being called upon to take this action is as an is to be an example to everybody else, because if the chief rabbi can break Shabbat and is eager to do so to save a life, then certainly everybody else can. He's leading by example. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now let's look at the case. All right, so you there's your principle, Gloria, saving okay. a life on Shabbat. So let's see now what happens. What's our jurisprudence? What, where's what's the actual case that's before us? Go ahead. How so? If one sees a child who fell into the sea, he spreads a fisherman's net and raises him from the water. Okay, stop there. Okay, the child, let's all understand the case. A child fell into the sea. Is that a life or death situation, Gloria? Absolutely. I would agree with you. <laughs> I would agree with you. It doesn't say a puddle. It doesn't say a pond. It doesn't say a well. It says a child fell into the sea. Nafal layam in Hebrew. That is a very, very, and it's, it says child, right? So uh, to me, the reason why it says child is to emphasize this is a life or death situation, okay? I'm allowed to take a net and raise him from the water. Why would I not be allowed to do that under ordinary circumstances? So the next sentence is going to explain. Go ahead, Gloria. And one who is vigilant and acts quickly is praiseworthy. And one need not seek permission from a court although in doing so he catches fish in the net as well ah there's your answer ah. look at how i mean it, look at how somebody who's very into the particulars of jewish law might hesitate to save the child that they will say okay taking a net i'm not really supposed to do it, but i can bend the rules but uh-oh you can't catch fish on Shabbat. And if I toss this net into the water, there's a chance that as I'm pulling up this child, I will also pull up some fish and violate Shabbat. So what should I do? Should I run to the rabbi and say, Rabbi, Rabbi, what should I do? Absolutely not. Again, this case introduces an element of of nuance to this argument, right? You might think that maybe you can't save a child if by doing so, you will violate one of the rules of Shabbat. Not as a direct consequence of your action, but as a, a sort of side consequence, unintended, I would say. An unintended consequence of saving this child is you catch some, catch some fish. Don't let it get in the way. You save the child, okay? There's our case before us. Now, here's another case. Go ahead, Gloria. Sim similarly, if one sees the child fall into a pit and the child cannot get out. Okay, stop there. Is that, Gloria, a life or death situation? It could be. It could be. Come on. How deep is the pit? Well, that it doesn't say how deep is the pit. What if he falls into What's a... What's in the pit? You don't know. It could be water. To me, I think this, because remember, one of the questions that I said we have to think about is, why add this case? We only are adding cases to add another layer of, here's something else that we should learn 
another situation of doubt where I want to teach you something. A, di- a case that's obviously very different than a child that falls into the that falls well, into the uh, the, the lake yeah. or the or the sea. Right. So you're unsure, Gloria, but I'll let everybody else decide for themselves. A child that falls into a pit might not be life or death. I mean, we can get the kid out after Shabbat. Most people can go a day without without food or drink. And and even if you can't, well, we'll throw a sandwich down the pit so that so he'll get something to eat. Right? So here's a child that falls into a pit. What do I do? Shouldn't I say, I mean, if someone would ask me, I'd say, well, that doesn't fall into the category of saving a life on Shabbat. The child's fine. But. Okay. So what does he do? He digs part of the ground out around the edge of the pit to create a makeshift step and raises him up. Ah, now, do you, now, how is that different than the fisherman's net? If, if, well, he's, well the, from what I can see, he has nothing to gain from it other than helping the child get out. He doesn't get any reward or he doesn't find gold down there or anything else. That's true. There's no reward. But the other thing I would add, Gloria, I hope some of you see this. The net's catching of fish is an unintended consequence. Usually in Jewish law, when you do something on Shabbat that you're not allowed to do, but it's not what you intended to do, you, you're off the hook. You're not liable for it. I didn't intend to do this. It just happened as a result. In Hebrew, it's in, in halachic literature, for those more advanced, it's called davar she'eno mitkavein. If I do something on Shabbat that wasn't my intention, it happened by accident. The, by the way, the famous example of this is um, uh, uh, video monitors that are motion detected. How is it that I can walk into Beth Tikva, and these are motion active cam motion active uh, cameras here, motion activated cameras. How is anyone allowed to walk in the building on Shabbat when we're turning on recording devices? Well, it's a davar she'inomit kavain. I'm not. I'm not really turning on the camera. I have no, my mind does not even think that I'm turning on the camera. I just walked into the building. The camera turned on by itself. So it's a bit of a complicated matter in Jewish law, but in general, the rule is if something was not intended to be done, you're off the hook. But look at this case, Gloria. How is this different? Here, you're digging of the ground around the pit, which creates a makeshift step, which is a clear violation of the laws of Shabbat called bone. You're not allowed to build anything on Shabbat. That is not an unintended consequence. You intended to build that step. So this case, how is it different than the fisherman's case? If you had to visualize it in your head, the fisher, the boy who falls into the sea is more of a life or death scenario, but the solution is less of a violation of Shabbat. Still, you save the boy. This case is less of a life or death situation, but more of a violation of Shabbat. But it really doesn't matter because the end result is the same. You do it. And not only that, read the last sentence, Gloria. I'll read the last sentence and then I want you to answer something about Okay. This. And one who is vigilant and acts quickly is praiseworthy. There you go. <clears throat> and one need not seek permission from a court, although in doing so, he fashions a step. Exactly. So don't hesitate. The, are you, is everyone getting the theme? The theme here is even to hesitate to save a life by breaking Shabbat is a problem, is worse than a problem. It's, it's sinful. One should rush to save somebody's life, even in a case of safek nefashot, when there's doubt about whether the person might die or live, that's good enough. 
So if you ask me, I see, I see in these cases great deal of, as I said earlier, a great deal of flexibility when it comes to defining the limits of saving a life or not. Okay, Gloria, you're... I just want an, to... Another the, question? That's about the fish again. Wouldn't it be, he be considered even more praiseworthy after he's rescued the child to throw the fish back in the sea again? <laughs> not and well, not even, I, then he's reaping rewards. That's another question. After he catches the fish, should he throw them back into the sea? I don't know the answer to that question. That's a good question. Um, that, that might be very that might be very good, but I don't think the rabbis consider it because for them, they're they're saying to catch a fish is forbidden on Shabbat. That's the action that you 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 pretty much know that you will be doing, although it's unintended. You just want to save the child. The fact that there's fish in the net also is not it's not your fault. Um, it's just what happens when you put a net into the water. But either way, uh, okay. you, you act and you act without hesitation. Okay. Thank you, Gloria. Um, Bell, could you read this? And are you okay to read, Bell, this next section here, the next case? Are you able to unmute? Similarly, there we go. Hi, Bell. Yeah. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Similarly, if one sees, of course, Isaac, <laughs> if one, similarly, if one sees that a door is locked before a child and the Hi. child is scared and crying, he breaks the door and takes the child out. Okay, stop and there for a second. Now help me here, Ben. Is this a life or death situation? Oh, you're on. Uh, you're on mute, Bell. Bell, is this life or death? It's not life or death. It sounds to me like this is not life or death. I agree with you. It especially because it says the child is scared and crying. It doesn't say the child is starving or is going to or has been in there for a for a week or a month. It's a child who's scared. By the way, everybody notices, what do the three cases have in common so far? What is common about the three cases? Someone write to me in the chat, if you can catch, I'll wait a couple, I'll wait 30 seconds. Let's see if anyone can catch it. Use the chat box to tell me, child, very good, Linda. A few people got it. Janet, Brenda. Okay, okay, great. Marilyn. It's all children. Uh, you can't help but wonder, are we being extra flexible because there's a child? And doesn't this also remind you of a question we asked on the first source about the pregnant woman? Are we worried about her craving or are we worried about the effect that her unsatisfied craving might have on a child? I wonder if, if I, I, it's a good question to ask somebody who's a, who's a doctor, whether a woman who has an unsatisfied craving, whether that could put stress on a child. It seems to me that that's not so crazy. I mean, any stress on a pregnant mother is bad. And when you have a craving that's not going satisfied, maybe there could be some stress on the mother. So to me, there might be a theme here. There might, might be a theme here, of, especially when it's a helpless child. You don't worry about Shabbat. Right? Maybe. Okay, so this is a child who is scared and crying. What do I do? The door is locked. I break the door, which would normally be forbidden. Right? To break, uh, to break the door. Okay, go ahead, Bill. And you want me to start with similarly? Uh, and one who is? And one who is vigilant and acts quickly is praiseworthy and one who need not seek permission from a court 
although he intends to break it into boards to be used later. Ah, okay. Stop there. So now I'm going to ask my question. What is different? So I asked what is the same. Now, what is different about this case that was not already addressed with the fisherman's net and the boy that fell into a pit? The, the boy that fell into a sea, the boy that fell into the pit, and the boy who got locked in who got locked in the closet. What is different about this case? Do you see, Belle, something that's different here? Well, about seeking permission. Well, all three said don't seek permission. I see. All three said that. That was the same. What's different about this case? The hint is here. Although he intends to break it into boards to be used later. Mm -hmm. In the That's first case that we right. looked at today, it was the case of the boy who fell into the sea. The challenge there was uh, the fish that would be also caught when I pulled the boy out of the water. That case is not such a serious violation of Shabbat because I don't really, I didn't intend to, to um, fish those fish. I, they just came along with the boy, right? I didn't really want to do it. I wasn't even active in, 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 in catching the fish. They just attached themselves to the net. That's case number one. Case number two, I'm going to, I'm now actively going to do something that's a violation of Shabbat. Intentionally, I'm going to make that step to create that makeshift step to help the boy. But is that step going to be useful to me at all? No. It's not, right, right, Bell? That step it's, is just to help the boy. It's like saving It's not life. for me. Right, I'm going to save his life. But the thing that I'm doing that is a violation of Shabbat, that is making that step, it's of no benefit to me. I don't need that step. That step is for the child. But here in the case you talked about, Bell, the boy stuck in the closet Right before I save the boy, I have a great idea, okay? I say, okay, I'm going to bash this door open and I'm going to have some wood. What a wonderful thing. And I can use the wood from the door that I break to build me a fire, right? Or to build some ramp that, I, that I'll be able to use. So why, why is this different? Because it's the, this is the most serious violation of Shabbat that we have yet to see. Even Not, though he doesn't, he doesn't intend to break the boards on Shabbat. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, he says, I'm going to smash this door open. And I'm going to use, unlike the pit, the boy that fell into a pit where I have no use for that step. The step is just to help the child. After it's done, I'm going to walk away. But here, there's benefit that I'm going to derive. Gloria, this might relate to your question about what's he going to do with the fish after he catches the fish. This case seems to suggest he can eat the fish. Even if I say to myself, I'm going to lift up the child with my net, and I'm sure that some fish are going to, are going to be attached, and I will eat the fish. I will have sushi for lunch. This case says you can still do it. You're allowed to use those boards and gain benefit from them to build a fire or, or build something. Because in the process, you saved this child's what? Did you save his life? I don't know if you saved his life, but you helped him you you helped the child not be in distress and you do when you're doing that you do it quickly and you don't ask permission everyone's with me okay bell case number four the last case 
So we have the boy in the sea, the boy in the well, and the boy in the closet. What's the next one? Similarly, one may extinguish a fire by placing a barrier of metal or clay vessels filled with water in front of it on Shabbat when life is in danger. Okay, case number four is not a child, or at least it could be, but there's no reference here to a child. What do we have? A burning house. And I think what we're talking about here with the barrier of metal or clay vessels is just think about it as a, as a medieval fire truck, okay? There's some vessels with water in it, and obviously it's going to be a big problem to use these vessels to, you know, on, on Shabbat, you're not allowed to extinguish a flame. But when there's somebody in the house whose life is in danger, I am permitted to, um, I'm permitted to put out the fire. And what is the, and what is new about this case? Why did I not know this already? Keep going, Belle. And one who is vigilant and acts quickly is praiseworthy. And one need not seek permission from a court, although he leaves the coals, which can be used for cooking after. Ah, Shabbat. okay. Guess what? There's even this fourth case now is the winner. It is the worst possible violation of Shabbat that there can be. Why? Let me go through this with all of you. We've seen four cases so far. Let's all stay, let's all stay with me. If you want to write this down, you can write it down. The boy in the sea. Yes, I'm going to. I'm going to catch some fish too when I pull them out of the sea. But those that was unintended. They just attach themselves onto the net. I have no use for those fish. I'll just leave them there. Case number two, the boy in the pit. I'm now intending to make a step, but that step is not for me. I will not benefit from the step. Only the boy will to help him out. It's a worse violation of Shabbat than the boy in the sea because there's intention. But it's not as bad as the third case. The third case of the boy in the closet. Why? Because now the boards that I broke, I will use them that week. Later that week, I'm going to say, hey, I'll use these boards for a fire. Perfect. Not only will I save a child, but I can have some boards to use for my house. Or maybe I'll sell them to somebody. I'll make some money off it. So that's an even worse violation of Shabbat because now you are going to personally benefit from the saving of the child. So far, we have not seen any case of personal benefit. But the worst of the worst cases is the house on fire. Why? Because after I put, you know, always the Talmud comes up with these cases. It's to prove a point. So think about the point. I'm going to ask you after, Bell. what is the point that Talmud is trying to make? Now, not only will I benefit from the coals, just like I benefit from the bro broken boards, I will benefit from those coals on Shabbat. That means after I put on the fire, I will take my stew that was sitting in my fridge and I will say, hey, I've got a great idea. I hate warm stew, but I just put out the fire in the house next door there's still some heat coming off the coals that are on the ground. Why don't I put my stew and heat it up on Shabbat on the hot coals that I just created? Okay. A personal benefit on Shabbat 
that has absolutely nothing to do with the person that I saved from the building. I saved the person's life by putting out their fire, putting out, putting out the fire. The story is done. But I just happened to notice that after I put out the fire, there's some beautiful hot coals that could be useful to me on Shabbat. I am allowed to use them. I am allowed to save the child. That when a life is at stake, it's all part of what ought to be, what needs to be. Don't ask questions. Don't worry about limits. Don't worry about boundaries. You are allowed to take advantage of the situation as much as you want. All because Shabbat is not at all as important as saving a life. There's something else that I want us to notice from these cases. So we've noticed a lot that three of the four cases deal with a child. That not all of these cases are so clear cut life and death. Some of them are meh. It's a scared child and doesn't sound like he's really going to die, but he's scared. Um, the other thing that, that I want you to notice here is they're all about Shabbat violation. While the Talmud plays with this idea of saving a life is more important than all, the, than, than all laws in the Torah, in this section of the Talmud, the only law that it's concerned with is the law of observing the Sabbath. It could have said, the law could have said, you know, the, uh, an example related to many other commandments in the Torah, like uh, thou shalt not steal or something. But all of the cases here are about violating Shabbat. Okay. Are there any, if you have any questions about this, I'll invite you to use the chat function. And remember, we'll save some time at the end of the class just to review, um, just to review some of these questions, and maybe I'll have, maybe I'll have an answer. Um, Janet says it's not just saving the child, but why should the child suffer because the adult has another reason for saving the child? Exactly. So Janet is saying one should never say to a child, "Hey, I can't save you because if I save you, I'm gonna." I'm going to do a forbidden activity on Shabbat. The child would say, don't worry about that forbidden activity. Save my life. So that's correct. Saving of a child's life comes first. Sherry says, using the wood is an unintentional consequence, and he will likely not build with it on Shabbat. No, I would say it is an intended consequence. If you, you're right that he won't use it to build on Shabbat. This is the man who breaks through the door to save the child who's in the closet. You're right that he's not going to build with it on Shabbat. I think if it was, it would say that like it does in the final example. But it is an intentional consequence, meaning I know that I will break this door. It's not like the fish where there's some doubt Maybe a fish might attach itself to my net. When I break that door, I know that I will have some wood now. Um, Sherry says, what if there was an idol at the bottom of the pit that the child prays to? Okay, that I haven't thought of that before. <laughs> That's possible. <laughs> Is the same true for violating a Yom Tov, asks Linda. So Linda, that's, the, that's what I just, um, I noted. In all of these cases, it's Shabbat. Why is it every time that it's Shabbat that is the observance that we are allowed to um, trump, the observance that we're allowed to disregard? So, so it's a very good question. Do all of these apply to all other commandments in the Torah? Or are we just talking about Shabbat? And Jerry says... After, if it, the final example says after Shabbat, then what is the lesson? So I don't see that it says, although he leaves the coals 
which can be used for cooking after Shabbat. Ah, so Jerry found something that I didn't, that I missed. Cooking, uh, I was using the example of heating up my chulent. Okay, so it would be the same thing because you're allowed to heat up your chulent on Shabbat, but you're not allowed to turn on the oven in order to do it. So if you have coals, you can say, oh, I'll use them to heat up my chillant. That would be okay. But you're correct, Jerry, that that's not the example here. The example here is the coals are still hot after Shabbat. And there is a rule in Jewish law that says, if you uh, violated Shabbat, you're not allowed to benefit from it until, um, and you realize it, you're not allowed to benefit from it after Shabbat. So here, it's the same sort of setup. It's just yeah. saying, if the coals are still hot after Shabbat, you can cook. You're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. But if I have a raw ch chicken that needs to be cooked, normally I would not be able to say, hey, I'll do it on those coals over there. Why? Because those coals were created through a violation of Shabbat. And you would not be allowed to benefit from something that was um, from something that resulted from the violation of Shabbat. Are you with me? If though since those coals resulted from the violation of Shabbat, you wouldn't be allowed to use them to cook after Shabbat. But if the reason those coals are there is because you saved a life, that law does not apply. Mm -hmm. So I hope that helps. The law does not apply if the coals are there because you didn't violate Shabbat. That's the point here. There was no violation of Shabbat. You saved your life. Because when you, a life is at stake, you're keeping Shabbat. Shabbat is, uh, uh, saving life is more important. So anything that happens on Shabbat that would normally be a violation like creating coals, getting that wood, using that step, catching those fish. All irrelevant side concerns, inapplicable side concerns, so long as it was a case where a life was at stake. And again, I'm saying a life with quotation marks, okay? Imagine quotation marks when I say a life is at stake, because some of these examples here it's not really clear whether a life is at stake or not. It's a, it's a life is in danger, let's say, or maybe a life is, is disturbed. Okay. Now we're going to move on to track to a different tractate of the Talmud, which talks about an important question that nobody has raised so far. The Ten Commandments, which many people will tell you, this is the, the Ten Commandments are the most important laws of Judaism. Includes, observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Where does the Ten Commandments say, except if a life is at stake? Where does the Torah say anywhere you don't have to observe the commandments, any of the commandments, if a life is at stake? I asked this question at the beginning of last class. And it's a rhetorical question because the Torah doesn't say that clearly, really anywhere. So after discussing all of these exceptions to keeping Shabbat, finally we get to, and on what grounds are we permitted to violate Shabbat in all of these egregious ways? Putting out a fire, catching fish, making boards, making building a step. All of these are egregious violations of Shabbat that you just told me I'm allowed to do. Well, how, how do you know that? So I'm going to 
call upon Florence to read the source which addresses that question. Where do we know that we're permitted to violate Shabbat in this way? Hi, Florence. The Gemara relates. Is that where I'm going? You yeah. got the it. The Gemara relates. It once happened that Rabbi Yishmael and Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Elaza ben Azaria were walking on the road, and Levi Hasadar and Rabbi Yishmael, son of Rabbi Elaza ben Azaria, were walking respectfully behind them since they were younger and did not walk alongside their teachers. Okay, so this just for a bit of context, some of you got you guys know some of these figures from the Haggadah? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elazar ben Azaria. These are the some of the most important rabbis of the Tanaitic period. That means the period when the Mishnah was written. These are big, big people. It doesn't get bigger than them. Okay. Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Akiba, these are the most important rabbis in Judaism, which should immediately cause us to say, whoa, okay, this is a big story here. This is important. They're walking, they have some students walking respectfully behind them. And what happened? This question was asked before them. From where is it derived that saving a life overrides Shabbat? Notice here. Does it say that saving a life overrides every principle in the Torah? No. Okay. Rav Yehuda Under, said, wait, 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 wait. Sorry. Underline Sorry. that. Okay. We learned in the first source, let's just review it. Ein lechadavar she'omed bifnei pikuach nefesh. There is no halakha that stands in the way of saving a life. But in the original story of where this comes from, and I think you can call this the original story, there is no mention at all of ein lechadavar. There is no halakha. The only reference is Shabbat. And the question is, where do we learn that Shabbat is more important? Oh, excuse me, that saving a life is more important than Shabbat. What's the answer? Go ahead. Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel oh, said. Whoa, 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 whoa. Rav Yehuda said that Shmuel said. What? We're, we're missing something here. They got asked the question, where's the answer? These are the most important rabbis in Judaism. They're getting asked a very, very important question. Where do we learn that saving a life is more important? The Talmud is silent. If I would have been... Nothing. There. It says I... nothing. Rav Yehuda and Shmuel lived, lived at least... 200 years later, they're, they're a different generation. I think 150 years later. So we're talking, this is a whole other era. There is no answer provided here. They don't know why. It takes another few decades for some rabbis to come along and say this. Now you can continue for us. If I would have been there among those sages who debated this question, I would have said that my proof is preferable to theirs, as, as it states, you shall keep my statues and my ordinances, which a person shall do and live by them. Ah, underline these three words and live by them. The Hebrew word is vechai bahem. I'm sorry, it got cut off here in the Hebrew uh, quotation, but this is a famous verse in the Torah. You shall keep all my observance and live by them. Keep going, Florence. And not that he should die by them. Ah, so that, does everyone understand where the proof is? He finds the proof in a verse in the Bible that talks about 
living by the commandments. And he says something very, very smart. That living by them means that if the commandment, observing the commandment will cause you to die, then you should not uh, observe the commandment. If it'll cause you to die, then your life takes priority. Okay, keep going, uh, Florence. In all circumstances, one must take care not to die as a result of fulfilling the mitzvot. In all circumstances. Now, hold on. This is just getting confusing. I thought we were talking about Shabbat. I thought the question was Shabbat. All these famous rabbis are debating this point. They don't have an answer. They don't know why saving alike takes priority. A couple generations later, Rav Yehuda and Shmuel say, we know the verse. The verse says, when you observe the commandments, you should live by the commandments. They should all be there to live by let's look directly at the torah to see whether this verse makes sense to all of you can you all see this new screen on your this is just from a, a, a biblegateway.com i think it's just a uh, different versions of the bible Florence, could you read for me? This is Leviticus chapter 18, the same thing we're talking about. The Lord. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Israelites, the Israelites and say to them, I am the Lord, your God. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live. And you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You ah, must obey. So I'm bringing you, I'm bringing you out of Egypt into Canaan. Egypt, don't do what they do. Canaan, don't do what they do. You do what I tell you to do. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am the Lord, your God. Here's keep the your verse. Everyone pay attention. Verse number five. Go ahead, Florence. Keep, keep my decrees and laws for the person who obeys them will live by them. I what am does Lord. that mean to you when this verse says, the person who obeys them will live by them. What does that mean to you, Florence, when it says, will live by them? If you observe, if you do what you're supposed to do, then I'll let you live. That's what it means to me, too. If you do these things, I'll let you live. <laughs> <laughs> right? And if you look at the list here in Leviticus 18 of all of the laws and decrees that we're talking about here, I mean, we don't have time to go through all of them, but they're all about sex. No one is to reproach any close relative to have sexual relations. Don't dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. You can see as I go down the verses, they're all laws regarding sexual impropriety okay so now that you notice that i want to make your brain hurt your brains hurt and not brain no i don't want to make your brains hurt i want to make you frustrated good frustrated okay first of all frustrated because what do you think of this interpretation live by them and not die by them. According to Shmuel, that means human life comes first, and you're allowed to violate all of the commandments so long as a human as so long as violating them is justified because a human life is at risk. So I invite you all to think to yourselves: does that make sense? Is Shmuel taking this verse completely out of context? Is Florence right when Florence says, no, I think live by them means if you don't listen to God, you're going to die. It doesn't mean that 
if any of the commandments cause a person to die, then you shouldn't follow that commandment. Right? That's number one. So, you know, I ask that question, I say, well, no wonder Rabbi Yishmael, Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Elazar, no wonder they didn't come up with that verse because that verse is really being twisted by Shmuel to make his point. But here's how I'm going to leave you really frustrated. Okay. That verse refers to all the laws of sexual impropriety. And the verse says, you live by, according to Shmuel, live by them and don't die by them. Which means if any of those laws cause a human life to die, you don't observe them. But let's go way back up to our first source to the three exceptions. What is exception number two? Read that, Florence. Which one? Uh, where, where I'm highlighting. Oh, uh, and, oh. And, for, and forbidden, and forbidden sexual You got it. Okay, do you, do you all understand my point? Let me say it one more time, because I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm hoping you're leaving frustrated. <laughs> Shmuel answers the question. I know the verse that says that human life is more important than the laws, than all the laws of the Torah. It's the verse that says, you shall keep my statutes and my ordinances, which a person shall do and live by them. And when it says live by them, it means don't die by them. But the very laws that my statutes and my ordinances are referring to here in the Torah. Do you see this? Now I changed screens. All of these laws, sex, 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 sex. You see that? All of those laws are laws that we learned in the first source. You are supposed to die rather than keep them. You are supposed to die rather than observe those commandments, or excuse me, rather than violate those commandments. So Shmuel is, a, is not taking this verse out of context a little bit. He's taking it out of context and creates a whole other problem. <laughs> Because it seems to me that if that verse means you live by the commandments and you don't die by them, that that applies to everything, certainly including the laws against prohibited sexual relationships. Because that's exactly the section of the Torah that that verse is from. Those are the statutes and ordinances. The statutes and ordinances that are being referred to he, right here are the laws against sexual impropriety. So do we keep them or are we allowed to violate them? <laughs> what I'm introducing to you here, I mean, I'll get, I'll, I'll, we'll develop this a little bit more, but here's what I wanna throw at you. I'm spoiling the, the surprise ending a little bit, but what I, wanna, what I wanna submit is that really this all just started as a conversation about keeping Shabbat or not. Why? Because there were wars during the first and during the first and second centuries. Serious wars. And there were Jews during that time that said, we are not allowed to pick up arms on Shabbat. We should let ourselves be killed. Also, by the way, that's too late. This, these wars even started in second century BC, right? During the, the um, Maccabean revolt. I referred to that last class. So throughout the second temple period, there were Jews who said, 
you don't pick up arms on Shabbat. That is the origin of this argument. Jews were getting killed because all the non-Jews knew, just attack them on Shabbat and be done with them. They won't be able to defend themselves. And there came this radical idea that you are allowed to violate Shabbat for the sake of human life. Radical. And I think you see the radicalism in the sources that we, the stories that we viewed today. You don't ask permission. You ask the head rabbi to do it. You, um, you don't uh, 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 hesitate. You are eager to do it. I mean, all of the language shows thou it protests too much. All of the language says, it, it's almost like it's speaking to somebody who is actually hesitating, speaking directly to that person, saying, how dare you hesitate? It makes me believe that there's an actual disagreement going on here. And so does this source here that talks about the most famous Tanaim being asked, hey, tell us why we're allowed to violate Shabbat, and they don't even know. They can't even come up with an answer. They just know. What is it that is causing them to be so certain that Shabbat is allowed to be violated when a human life is at risk? And I might say to you, okay, don't all go crazy when I say this, but I might say to you, it is the human moral impulse the human moral impulse which sometimes trumps even the question of whether you have textual support in the torah for what you are doing maybe these great rabbis said we don't know why you're allowed to violate shabbat but we know you should. Why? The moral impulse. Because we don't believe that God would want it to be that any other way. Have I left you disturbed? Are you disturbed? I hope you're disturbed. That's very disturbing. I thought, I thought the Torah was given by God. How dare these rabbis strike out important laws in the Torah? Like observe Shabbat. Pretty big one. Because they feel that there are certain cases when you should. I don't want to go further because I'm going to spoil the rest of the class. But I've, if I disturbed you, I did my job. Okay. I have a, I'll unmute everybody now. Ask you if you have any questions. Oh, good. R Rabbi, isn't there the, the principle of always choosing life? Choose life? Where? Um, yes, the Bible does little... say... The Bible does say, here I have put you. There's a famous reading on Yom Kippur. Yes. Here I have put before you life and death. Yes. Curses choose life. and blessing. And you shall choose. Yeah, life. That, yes. That's, that's a reason, no? That is not the verse that they went with. <laughs> it's not the verse that they went with. That's the first thing I'd say. And, I mean, you'd have to admit, Linda, it, it's, it's not clear that just because the verse says that, that you should always choose life over death, that it means you should violate other laws in the Torah when a life is at stake, right? Because I could just say to you, yeah, and the Ten Commandments says observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. So which one's more important? You have to find some source that says when you have the two values um, conflicting with each other, you go with the life. 
right? But yeah, that's just not the verse they chose to go with. Anyone else? Are you finding this interesting? I was nervous with this material because it's very Talmudic. I know we don't always like long Talmudic stories, but I thought a nice, th this really has to be presented from the Talmud because I, I find the Talmudic era is when this idea is really developing and struggling. There's struggle here in the text. Does this apply to all cases? Does it apply only to violating Shabbat or does it apply to all the other rules in the Torah too? And where is it that where have we found this these three exceptions in the Torah? Right? All the verse says is live by them and don't die by them. It doesn't say unless dot dot dot. So we still have unanswered questions here. Rabbi? Yes, Lou. Yeah. It sounded, it sounds to me like the story when God was giving Moses some of the rules of Kashrut. And he said to Moses, thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. Yeah. Right? And Moses said, oh, I think I understand what you're saying. It means that I cannot have milk and meat in the same meal. So God said, Moses, all I said was, thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. And Moses says, ah, I think I got it. You have to have two sets of dishes, one for milchiks, one for meat. And that's how you have to live. You have to have the same utensils, two different sets of utensils. God said to Moses, Moses, all I said was thou shalt not see the kid in its mother's milk. Moses said, ah, for Passover, it means we have another complete set of dishes and utensils and everything. And God says to him, Moses, have it your way. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the same thing? <laughs> I've heard that joke before, Lou. It, there's actually a lot of truth in that joke. <laughs> there is a lot of truth in it. You, uh, you're, you're not far off, Lou, because what... What the rabbis are doing, they're doing exactly what Moses is doing in that joke. It's a great Jewish joke because there's truth in it. They're doing, they're doing exactly what Moses is doing. It's, okay, God, what, what do you want us to do in this situation? And the rabbis are themselves, I would submit, deciding this is what we're going to do. Even though I even though the textual support is weak, very weak. We just know intrinsically that life comes first, that we cannot just allow ourselves to be killed in order to observe Shabbat. Roz, you had a question? Yeah. So I just get mixed up with time periods. In um, this passage that we just read about you know the the guys from the Haggadah, uh, Rabbi. Yes. Yishai. So when they're walking with these with these other two behind them, what time? That's what time period is that? That's the Tanaitic period. So, for instance, here I'll give you Rabbi. You can just look up Rabbi Akiva's dates. Right. Rabbi Akiva died in the year one thirty five C.E. So he and was born in in um the year 50 CE. so it's the so, second century ce first second century ce yeah and then um um th these other two yehuda and shmuel they're are much later years. yeah let me get you the exact date well, I, yeah, this is the uh, i'll try to get isaac coming back <laughs> Um, so he is the second century CE, the fourth generation. So let's say 50, uh, let's say 50 years later. Okay, but this is all part of the rabbinic period, you said? Yes, like, oh yeah, yeah, there, it's all so part it's of the rabbinic So it's all part of this two to five century CE period. Yes, for sure, for sure, for sure. 
so it's so are, is one rabbi more authoritative? Well, than sure. The, next? the earlier rabbis, they're called the Tanaim. The Tanaim, Tanaim are more. Um, they carry a lot more weight to them than the Amoraim. The Amoraim are the Babylonian. Many of them are the Babylonian rabbis of the Talmud, like in this example. These are Babylonian rabbis, like Yehuda and Shmuel. Exactly. Okay. Right. So they're later. Okay. I thought it, I, I, this source says 50, but I think it's even later. I'm going to take a look. Okay. But the, uh, okay. they're, they, m my point in submitting this is the early rabbis don't really know. Only later they say, ah, uh, we think we found a, a source here. But, but the earlier been. ones carry more weight, you say. Yes. And even they couldn't, they knew that. They knew that human life came first. They just didn't have an answer as to why. Rabbi? Okay. Yes. Rabbi, don't we have to consider also when this was taking place? You said around the, um, uh, anyway, from the first to the fourth century. This is when we were exiled from Israel. Our whole religion, our whole, uh, our whole understanding was being, Absolutely. being taken. And we needed, we needed somebody who's going to give us an interpretation. And this is what we're talking about now. Absolutely. And not only that, but in exile, Jews were faced with many more situations where their, life, their lives were in danger. And so these questions don't become just philosophical anymore. They're real. Yep. When am I allowed to violate the rules and when must i must i uh sacrifice my life 